We worship in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join together in the prayer of the day. Lord God, you know that we are surrounded by many dangers and that we often stumble and fall. Strengthen us in body and mind and bring us safely through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The psalm appointed for this weekend is Psalm 1. We'll sing the refrain and verses in Gloria together. pray. Lord God, you have planted us like trees beside streams of water. Grant that we may ever delight in your word and yield abundant fruit in our lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First lesson that we read this weekend is part of Moses' farewell address to the nation of Israel. He writes it recorded in Deuteronomy 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. 
you must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. This is God's word. During this epiphany season, the second lesson has been a series of readings from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. We are at the beginning of chapter 8 today. Now about food, sacrifice to idols. We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up, while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know, but whoever loves God is known by God. So then, about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone possesses this knowledge. Some people are still so accustomed to idols that when they eat sacrificial food, they think of it as having been sacrificed to a god. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone with a weak conscience sees you, with all your knowledge, eating in an idol's temple, won't that person be emboldened to eat what is sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother or sister, for whom Christ died, is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against them in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother or sister to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again, so that I will not cause them to fall. This is God's word. We stand for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> gospel this week is recorded by Mark in chapter 1. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then a man in their synagogue, who was possessed by an impure spirit, cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is the gospel. We join together to speak the verse of the day. Alleluia. The Spirit of the Lord is on me. He has anointed me to preach good news. Alleluia. And we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. 
he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. The hymn of the day for this weekend is Seek Where You May to Find a Way. People walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. We hear God's word at the basis of the message this weekend from the first lesson of this weekend as Moses writes in Deuteronomy chapter 18. You may be seated. In the name of Jesus Christ, our only Savior. 
Certainly as you read the Bible, you know that God is the central character, and without him there isn't anything here, and without him there is no hope in this life or in the life to come. And certainly Jesus and his cross are the one message we need to make our own, and we need to communicate to others. That's the message that saves. But as we look at all the other characters in the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, uh, specifically the Old, is there a character, a figure greater than Moses? Who else served the way Moses did? He was a prophet. People recognized that he was set apart by God, and what he said wasn't his own words. They were things God said, this is what you tell the people. Throughout the Old Testament, we see that this is what the Lord says. And Moses absolutely did it. God gave him a message, and he presented it to the people. Moses was also one who was a mediator between the perfect, holy, almighty God who would judge sin and the nation of Israel, who's called over and over again in the Old Testament a stiff-necked people, and not just because they slept all cockeyed on the pillow last night, they just set themselves against God because that's what the sinful nature and the sinful mind does. And yet Moses was the one who would plead for the people. He was recognized as that go-between. And Moses was a civic leader as well. He was the one recognized as not just one who spoke God's word, but he was, he was in charge of everything they did. They wandered in that desert for 40 years with Moses. And he was the one in charge of everything. I'm not filling out a job application for that one. That's an amazingly complicated job. So he's the prophet. He's the mediator. He's the civic leader. He's a figure of Christ who is to come. Moses is the one who is standing before Pharaoh saying, let my people go. Moses is the one who writes the first five books of the Bible. There's an awful lot of words there. There are five really big, long books covering an awful lot of history in this world and much of God's law and much gospel as well. And he writes a psalm as well, Psalm 90 that we use during the season of end times, Psalm 90 that we use on uh, New Year's Eve as well psalm that moses wrote and in the new testament jesus refers to moses partly because the pharisees and sadducees were rejecting what jesus said rejecting this new teaching that we heard in the gospel reading today they would accept what moses wrote and the pharisees and sadducees would accept what what moses said as coming from god so how many times in the new testament does jesus turn it right back on them you're rejecting me, what I'm saying, but I am in complete agreement with what Moses, your recognized leader, wrote all those years ago. So are you really following what you're saying or not? Jesus refers to him for that reason. Plus also, Moses was set apart by God for that work and spoke Moses' work, spoke God's words. So Jesus and Moses throughout this lesson in Deuteronomy, and as we connect what Moses did and how he served the people, there's a definite similarity to what Jesus does. But though there is a similarity, Christ is far superior, isn't he? Could Moses die for any of the Israelites to save them from sin and an eternity of being separated from God? He couldn't do that. Only Jesus could do that, and only Jesus did. Moses led the people, but only as God directed him. Moses did come up with this plan. This is how we're going to spend the next 40 years. It was all under God's plan and God's control. Moses couldn't die for them. Moses couldn't lead for them. Moses couldn't write down his own words. Moses, again, writes the first five books, starting with Genesis. And in Genesis 1 and 2, Moses tells us what God made on each of the six days of creation. Was Moses there taking notes? He wasn't even there. Adam and Eve weren't even there during the first five days. They finally appear on day six. How does Moses, who comes all these years later, know what God made on day one and two all the way through creation unless God tells him, this is what I did? So Moses is absolutely respected, but he is not superior to Christ. Christ alone is the epiphany Lord who by what he says and how he says it, the miracles he performs, and his perfect life and sacrificial death, that's what's going to save the people. That's what the people needed. 
Think of Old Testament Israel. They're prosperous and they're successful. We have all this blessing from God through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, through Joseph. Not that they were perfect and sinless. The Bible records all kinds of sins that they committed. And yet amazing blessings and grace and mercy from God and always a promised Savior wasn't there. And that's what the people really needed. That's what they really wanted. But after Joseph saves all the people by seeing that they're going to have seven great years of extra food for the seven years of famine, all the, the, his, his whole family goes to Egypt, but what happens for the next 400 years? They're slaves, because the Egyptians realize there's a lot of them. And what happens if they decide to rebel? Not like his, the family was building an army, raising an army, saying we're going to overthrow the Egyptians. They were all going to return back to their promised homeland one day, but they were slaves for 400 years. Several generations come and go in this world's history knowing only slavery. And then there's the Exodus, which comes only by God's direction and only as God allows it to happen. And the Israelites make it to Sinai. No longer slaves, but not quite back in the promised land yet. And what was that scene at Sinai as God is giving the law to Moses? Moses didn't say, you know, I need a summer to finish my great American novel. I'm just going to go and write. No, he was up on top of the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Six weeks, he's up there. And the scene up there was one of fire. And the Israelites recognize, we can't survive here. We can't survive in this scene of God's glory, God's power, God's holiness. Sinners can't match that. And if the nation of Israel set apart and God's chosen people, though they were, if they were perfect and sinless, that scene isn't going to terrify them, is it? But what do they say? In our section here, Moses says, you yourself said, give us a prophet. Give us someone who will speak to us so we don't see this amazing scene of God's power and divine authority and awesomeness. We can't survive. They want peace. And that scene on top of the mountain showed them we can't survive here. Not on our own. Something has to make this better. But they could do nothing to make it better. They couldn't go back in time. They couldn't pay any amount of money. Nothing they were ever going to do was going to pay for their sin. So there's going to be no peace. Not even Moses could provide that peace on his own. He simply has to present to them what God says. And that's what he does do. God promises to do it himself. To actually take on human flesh. And the Savior, even though he is God, will live under the law he gave. And he'll obey it perfectly so that every Israelite will be forgiven when Jesus dies on that cross. And so will you and me. And that's why Moses says, listen to that prophet. You want peace? You want to be out of the darkness and living in the wondrous light? It only comes as you listen to God's divinely anointed prophet. As he says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. From among your own brothers, Jesus, even though he's God, is going to come from Israel with a human history, with, with a human ancestry. We recognize that both in Matthew and in Luke. The genealogies of Mary and Joseph trace all the way back to, to the promise with Abraham and all the way back to Adam, actually. And that one will be sent by God who would be anointed to save the world. And yet, God isn't, going, God isn't going to die for the sins of the world. There was a human who would do it. So God, fully God, with that awesome power of all his glory and honor and majesty at the Mount Sinai, would be born as a human little baby about a month ago as we celebrated and be completely dependent on human parents to care for him. And he's going to grow as you and I do. And he's going to be tempted as you and I are. But he was the one without sin. True God and true man. And that's why Moses says, you must listen to him. We must listen to him, not because he has the new COVID rules for how to be safe, you know, how to wear your mask or how many of them you got to wear, how far apart you got to be from people and how long you got to quarantine. All important stuff as far as health and medicine goes, but doesn't matter for eternity, does it? And we don't have to listen to this one 
this prophet sent by God because he's got a great political agenda for you and I to follow. Nor do we have to listen to the prophet sent by God because he's got the next stock tip, the one that's going to tell us this week what, what's going to gain 300% so we can buy now rather than later when it's too expensive to buy. All valuable for this world, but what do any of them matter for eternity? We must listen to him because that's the only message that will save sinners and bring the peace that we so desperately want and need. We must listen to him because he's speaking the truth. We mentioned that Moses writes Psalm 90 that we use on New Year's Eve. The second lesson that we read on New Year's Eve is the end of chapter 1 of Peter's first letter, where he says, The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. The prophet sent from God will speak the truth and will speak the unchanging truth. Which you saw in the Wells Connection as we look back and look ahead, like we're going to do tomorrow at our congregational meeting as well, and like we regularly do. We make all kinds of plans. How can we connect? How can we best use the resources we have? But with everything that's changing in this world, we believe ourselves and take to others a changeless Christ. That is the one thing that will always remain the same. And we need to listen to that prophet because he's the one who speaks the word of God, not the word of men. Throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, still today, so-called Christian churches are they're not really speaking God's word, are they? Listen to what they say. Read their books. Where's the cross? And where's sin? Now, people don't want to hear that. So let's just not talk about it. Well, if there is no law, and no breaking of the law, why do I need a cross? If we completely get rid of God's law and God's gospel, and we make it some human agenda, maybe political or whatever kind of human idea, but when we remove God from the picture, there's no accountability to God, is there? I don't want to hear it, so don't say it to me. You didn't tell me to do that. You called me 20 years ago and said, use this book. Not just the parts that make me feel good about myself. Tell me the truth that's in this book. Not just what I want to hear. Tell me what I need to hear. And do that as the second lesson pointed out. Speak that authoritative truth of God in a loving way. Thank God you have the faith you have. And may God bless our efforts to share that with others so they will understand it as well, not be groping around in the darkness of unbelief. We'll see the light and see the peace got to listen to that one prophet sent from God as God says he's not going to hold anybody unaccountable if they don't listen and don't do what he says people regularly ask why are all the bad things happening in the world what's what's God doing well it's not like he's not in control anymore we are the ones who are sinning he's the only one who can provide the peace there is a judgment coming there are still deaths and funerals in this world. Why? Because we sin. And yet the prophet speaks that true comforting message, I'll pay for it. So it's not an ending and it's not a loss. God still claims all of his own. That's why the Israelites must listen to the prophet sent from God. It's easy for you and me today to look ahead to the New Testament and see how Jesus is by far the only one who can be the fulfillment of this prophecy, right? Brought up from among the Israelites, got Jewish ancestors from the line of David, from both his mother and father's side. Maybe next to Moses, David might be the most well-known and, and, and successful as we look at it, human character of the Bible. But he too is dependent on that offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. That's where the peace still is for you and me. You and I are not Old Testament Israel. We're not wandering around in the desert for 40 years. We don't see that amazing scene of God's power and glory on top of Mount Sinai. But we need the same peace, don't we? And we have that same peace through that changeless Christ who says, I died for the Israelites as my chosen people. I died for you because... That's the work the anointed was sent to do. The entire world sinned against God. The one sent by God will atone for all the world's sins. 
We may not look or dress or eat like Old Testament Jews, but we can completely see ourselves in this section from Deuteronomy, don't we? And that's the changeless message with the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Not just the day. What are you doing on that day? How are we keeping that day holy? We have to use the book. We got to listen to what's in this book. And we have to learn what's in this book. And we have to live by what's in this book. That's the, uh, that's the changeless part of the third commandment. In the Old Testament, he designated the day and all the things the priest did and, and carefully set up all those rites and sacrifices. They're not repeated for you and me that we must follow them in the New Testament church as they were laid out in the Old Testament church. But what still does apply? <laughs> listen to it, learn it, and live it. Why do you and I have to still listen to this word? None of us knows what's in this book by nature. We can learn a lot of things by experience. You live in Minnesota long enough, you know that in January, take a coat. Probably some boots and some gloves, right? Because it's going to be cold. And you go out in July, take the bug spray. You're probably going to need it. You can learn that by experience. You can learn all kinds of things about your car, your kids, your animals, your pets, because you spend that much time with them. You learn that by experience. Do we learn anything about God saving the world apart from this book? It doesn't happen. That's why we must listen to it so that we can know what God says and have the truth in a world that's full of messages, full of a lot of sounds, but don't have the message that brings peace. As a congregation, tomorrow as we, we make plans at an annual meeting, what's, how would you summarize in the simplest form what we do tomorrow? We're going to plan how we can do this. How can we connect to Christ? How can we receive from him so we can respond in a way that honors him? We're not going to respond unless we've received it first. So we must listen. And then we got to learn it and then live according to it. The number one thing we do as a church is worship together. Certainly we can't do that in the numbers we're used to doing and the way we're used to doing it. But we can still connect Again, had a reference on the Wells Connection about that. We do have some resources available to us to offset the challenges that are before us. And what's the ultimate goal? How can all of us listen to this word? So that faith is created or that faith is strengthened. So our public worship life, our personal worship and devotional and prayer life, that's where this foundation for a congregation lies listening to the prophet so that we can respond in that way. Thinking again of those phrases, connected to Christ, he's the prophet speaking the unchanging truth. And we're going to receive from him publicly and privately so that we can respond to him. God certainly knows the challenges that we face as individuals, as a congregation, as a synod, Christians around the world. <clears throat> We had challenges before COVID. We're going to have challenges once that's forgotten about, although maybe it's probably not ever going to be forgotten about. And God knows the challenges, but he said, I can still equip you with the resources necessary to connect to the one and only life-changing message, the true message. We wonder so much is what we hear and what we see the truth. God's the one who wrote this book. And God can't lie. What's in this book and what God says to us is going to be the truth. He knows the challenges. We humbly ask that he would bless all of our efforts to connect and respond in a way that will always strengthen us in our devotion to him and be that light for others as well, whether it's the day of the annual meeting or not. The prophet is going to speak God's truth. That's God's unchanging will for the commandment. Not just the day, and not even specifically how, but are you listening, learning, and by God's grace, living according to it for his glory. And the peace of God, which passes our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand for the prayers that are next in our service order.
almighty and eternal God, when the time had fully come, you sent your Son to take our place under the demands of the law and to endure the just punishment for our sins. For your sake, you accepted his sacrifice on the cross and raised him from death to glorious splendor. When the time had fully come, you bestowed your spirit on your people as a testimony that you had called them to proclaim the gospel to every creature. Equipped and encouraged, they carried the word of salvation into all the world. When the time had fully come, you made our forefathers bold to take their stand on the truth of your word. You've blessed their sons and daughters and have enabled us to preserve and proclaim the saving gospel. Let this be a time, Lord, when you renew us again by word and sacrament, when you reform our hearts and minds, and when you restore to us the joy of fellowship and service. Grant to us in this age and in this place the courage of the apostles, the steadfastness of the reformers, and the dedication of those who have gone before us. May this be a time, Lord, for confession and repentance, Forgive us for the apathy that harms our faith and hinders our works. Forgive us for boasting of our past achievements and for blaming others for our present problems. Rid us of indifference to public worship and Bible study. Destroy the distrust that plagues us and shatter every thought and word that harms the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Let this be a time, Lord, when we recommit and reconsecrate ourselves to the ministry of your gospel. And let us find joy in our unity, zeal for our work, and success in our labor. Lord, we also come to you on behalf of all those who are mourning the deaths of Dorothy Breitbach and Lila Keeker, whom you have both called to yourself earlier this week. Remind us from your word that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And since the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Remind us of your words to your disciples that in our, in, in our Father's house are many rooms. And you are going there to prepare a place for us. We thank you for taking Dorothy and Lila to their places of eternal glory and ask that you would continue to strengthen and encourage us on our path to that same heavenly glory. Hear us, Lord, as we also join to pray as our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. May be seated for our closing hymn. It's hymn 556 out of the hymnal. Rise, shine, you people. Mm -hmm. 